Hi everyone. Good morning. Good evening, and a very warm, warm good afternoon to everybody. Welcome. Thank you. In the sustainable future food talk series by Satvikko, the topic for today is new age marketing trends, digital and analog. Uh, today we have with us Mr. Raj Sharma, uh, who will be the who will be moderating the discussion. Uh, Mr. Sharma is an international business consultant. He has a distinguished career in the FMCG industry with stints in Unilever and Nestle. He retired a couple of years ago from Nestle, whereas the head of exports he was. part of the managing committee also he has had exposure in procurement manufacturing supply chain and other functions but his core competence has been sales and marketing currently as a country manager of global appetite inc a canadian company he is helping them develop their international business as a business consultant he has been utilizing his years of experience in mentoring startups he advises several small and medium sized companies on product and packaging development communication strategy channel development and other aspects towards the objective of enabling business development both in india and abroad an alumnus of modern school saint stephen's college and fms university of delhi mr sharma is also involved in social work and community development so uh, great to have you all here and uh, mr sharma over to you thank you dawal uh and uh, welcome once again all of you uh, as you rightly said it's good evening for two of our panelists uh, sit situated in australia and uh, new zealand and uh, i guess uh, good morning to uh, uh, nikki um uh, let me just uh, uh, introduce the uh, panelists uh, for this very interesting uh, i would say topic today uh which as double rightly said is new age marketing trends uh, digital and analog uh our first panelist uh, today is uh, rafael porto carrero uh rafael is a food uh, seller buyer matchmaker for asia pacific and uh, i really like his uh, introduction it says think of him as the tinder for food trade rafael <laughs> is uh, incidentally also the founder ceo of food jockey So Rafael has been an international journalist, and from that he turned into a food exporter entrepreneur. He's been selling his family's pancake brand Marcells to major retailers like Coles and fast food chains like Burger King in 14 countries in Asia Pacific. Rafael speaks seven languages. Today we shall only speak to him in one language, English. Uh, another uh, panelist today is Nikki McKenzie. Nikki has uh, 20 years experience helping companies to identify opportunities and develop the systems and approaches necessary to achieve their strategic goals. She helps to develop solutions to a client's needs and share uh, with them some clear and decisive communication. Building on her twin courses in business management and French from Institut d'Administration des Entreprises Uh, well part said. Of, <laughs> that was entreprise, entreprise, entreprise. Oh, but good, very good. Okay. And many years working in the export markets, she has developed a great network of contacts across the world and a sound knowledge of export regulations, international logistics, and customs and excise. Having worked with and traveled in various countries in Europe, Asia, and the Far East, she has good cultural awareness. and strong strategic planning skills particularly passionate about healthy eating and sustainability uh, extremely important in today's world outside of work she is recharged by gym workouts long walks good food and travel she also loves a good renovation project and she has been able to combine professional passions and personal interests with equal zest a third panelist today nicole maler uh, situated in australia Nicole's business journey began about 5 years ago when she was trying to re-enter the workforce after a surprise third child. She struggled to get a job. Um like many women uh, in her age, so she decided to create a business that combined her passion for food, corporate marketing skills and allowed her to work flexibility to get that work-life balance right. I think that's an excellent uh, 
process. Very good. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you can be rightfully proud of the exciting and innovative food business that she had created over the last five years, despite a major accident which left her wheelchair bound for seven months. Ooh. Ongoing surgeries, learning to walk again, and other business challenges faced by startups, including the fact that she didn't know anything about running a food business when she started. Congratulations. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, How a, hard a can it be, woman, right? A fighter all around. A first brand, Delicious, was born to create a range of products that were plant based and supported her two daughters' desire to be vegan, plus ensuring mm -hmm. meals were nutritious and tasted delicious. Rave mm -hmm. reviews gave her the confidence to move production to a commercial facility so she could supply dal to any, on any scale and begin distributing to stores. Her next range, Vegilicious, or Vegilicious, was added to offer consumers the delicious, rustic goodness of farm, French farmhouse recipes and appeal to people who like more traditional flavors. More recently, she released a new range, Mexilicious. COVID-19 and lockdown reflection time has led her to undertake a major rebrand, moving to Vegan Made Easy. So very, very interesting uh, uh, panelists uh, this afternoon or this evening. And uh, let me uh, uh, plunge straight away into the topic for today, which is, of course, uh, new age marketing trends and uh, what is uh, determining the new age marketing trends. I would say that this topic, new age marketing trends, holds good at... Uh, almost any time in any decade, in any century, because uh, marketing trends keep changing, they come and go, and uh, there will always be some new age marketing trends. Uh, where we are, uh, uh, you know, coming uh, on, on particularly for today's topic is, of course, that there is a big emergence of uh, digital uh, uh, marketing techniques, marketing tools, and yet, I would say, in a sense, that the the uh, non-digital or analog marketing tools have not completely uh, become irrelevant. Mm. So, of course, marketing trends evolve as brands strive to better leverage the latest technologies and respond to shifts in the marketplace. It's not just about making a splash or creating attention-grabbing content anymore. After making target audiences aware of their existence, businesses must then connect with prospective customers in meaningful ways, build a reputation as a trusted source of information, and nurture those relationships. That's a lot to accomplish when so many consumers are preoccupied with managing the effects of the global pandemic on their lives. To reach people in this climate, brands would be wise to leverage emerging marketing trends that promise to give them an edge over the competition. And thereafter stimulate repeated purchases. These, there were several modes of analog marketing that were available to the marketer. These haven't all become redundant or ineffectual. But new age marketing trends, new ways of attracting the consumer to your product, these have come about. And you have to be conversational, you have to be interactive. You have to make your marketing tools experiential. Without doubt, digital marketing is now playing a big part in attracting consumers. But what is the role of digital marketing and to what extent is analog marketing still relevant? That is the discussion we need to have today. Let me uh, start uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure that all of you who are sort of new age uh, marketeers and uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, uh, well, I say uh, young definitely compared to me. So uh, may not be young compared to Dhawal, but let, let's, let's uh, start with our uh, uh, panelist who is farthest east. So Rafael, maybe you can go first on uh, what you think about the uh, new age marketing trends and where do we stand? Um, I mean, yeah, that could be a talk for like a century, a millennium. Um, yeah. I think you touched on a couple of things. You know, you said experiential, you said um, that analog still has a role to play. Yep. I think, to be honest, um, 
if you're talking about food marketing specifically, offline, online, just go hand in hand together. I think that distinction is not, it's literally physical and it's literally virtual, of course, but they just need to align. It's one flow. And I suppose Raj is still here. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so I think the key the keyword for me, if you, if you talk about food marketing, is community. Um, I think the biggest shift, or the bigger shift over the last couple of years, and even in the post-COVID world even more, is about building community more than just a brand. You know, you had times where you had like a product, then that shift moved to, to branding, marketing, and then now this is about community building. And then the, uh, Savitko is maybe not yet worldwide known like Nestle, <laughs> if I can put it like that, but um, I think they are a really good example. So for people who are listening in who don't who are not familiar with the brand Savitko who are organizing this tour, they are they have a product, Macana beans, so lotus pop seeds. Um, and you could just sell it as a product. You could sell it as a brand, Macana, or you can do like what they're doing, food marathons, yoga, yoga marathons across the globe. So if you're in a COVID world, it connects online globally. So they're building like a, a tribe, a community. And I think the, that's where everything is heading. So when you move to the next stage of this, but we can get to this later because um, I don't want to take all the time. When you talk about the virtual reality, when you go into these metaverses, which are people are, you know, now it's a big hype, but at some point it will be a reality. Um, that is going to go even more into that particular community. So you need to be able to reach out to them. And your, your product on shelf, your packaging needs to reflect all these things. You need to occupy a hashtag. You need to know what your customer is doing, where they're sitting, where they're shopping, seeing at the same eyesight. Mm. So, yep, I'll leave it at that. So okay. Um, yeah. No, no, uh, I think uh, uh, very appropriately said. Uh, uh, maybe I move to uh, Nicole now. Sure. Um, I think the, the word that's popped up the most for me um, over the last um, year or two has been um, authenticity. And um, authenticity has um, really become more than just a buzzword, but um, something that we need to really deeply understand what that means to our consumers. Um, and it's much more than just being honest. Um, it's about um, there, there's, a, there's a thirst, or I believe that there's a thirst for um, us as brands to be very real um, and relatable and approachable and vulnerable and not perfect. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of suspicion from consumers. I think about the highly polished um, campaigns of, you know, years gone by and, um, they want to see um, their brands as more real um, and enjoy the stories and the journeys um, behind the brands. And I think that that drives what, Raphael, you were saying, that connection and, and building community, and that's becoming um, increasingly more and more popular. Um, I guess what goes hand in hand with that that I've um, just started to really dive into is looking as brands, as all of us, as into collaborations and collaborations with like-minded either associations, groups, and uh, other brands, you know, that, um, to present, you know, um, a broader community, you know, to your consumers. Um, and uh, those collaborations, you know, um, can, can reach you beyond, you know, just the everyday product selling, but more into even into across into social causes and, you know, whatever your audience is interested in, you really need to be interested in and have a position on as well. They want you, I believe, that consumers are demanding that you have a position on um, things that are meaningful to them, you know, whether it be climate change, whether it be, you know, whatever it is, whether it be veganism and, you know, that, that kind of area. So I think that whole authenticity, it's a complex issue and it's one that I've, I've given a great deal of thought and um, I've put together a bit of a, um, uh, a bit of a three uh, prong attack of how you you go about um, generating authenticity as a brand, but I'll get into that later. But I think that encapsulates what I'd like to talk about um, or explore today. Good, thank you. 
Uh, uh, Rafael, just one point. You men mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, digital marketing uh, is, of course, uh, the emergence. Uh, some of you, or I don't know if all of you are uh, into uh, international marketing. My uh, understanding is that uh, when you go into digital, the, the possibility of uh, being global with your uh, marketing comes to that extent sort of easier. You know, most of the <clears throat> analog marketing is relatively localized, even if it is a television channel, you know, they beam it into a certain uh, area. And certainly, uh, you know, other things like billboards, or, uh, you know, radio, yeah. etc. are localized, newspapers, magazines. But but dig uh, digital can, can enable you to go uh, global, international with your campaign. Uh, you have any comment on that? Me? Nikki. Oh, maybe Nikki. <laughs> oh, yeah, Nikki is the one I... who, who knows her brands globally. So yeah, we'll... we'll, we'll <laughs> I think that's that true. Way. I think um, certainly from building a community point of view, which is what we're talking about, I think it's incredibly important. And you, I think the brand, as a brand, you have to have that you have to know what your USP is. You have to know what you stand for before you start talking about it to other people um, and be convinced of that. Because I think what Nicole said is very true, that people are looking more and more for authenticity behind the brands. They're looking for a story. They're looking for the meaning behind it. Um, and as we're all convinced, I think, probably here today, that you know the future of, of food is sustainable, is healthy food. Um, it's a better way to feed the planet. It's an easier way to feed the planet. It's less costly for the environment and for the individuals involved. Um, and I think that most consumers now across the world are getting a little bit sick of being bombarded with adverts all the time. So I think you've yeah. got to know your community. You've not got to know your target audience. And all those lovely big bots behind Google and Instagram and all those things that actually they seem awful, but they're there to help us because they will help us to target our audience and to actually communicate with people who are who have the same baseline interests as us. So it helps you to grow that market. So I think you have to be aware that you might not agree with all these big companies, but you have to be aware of how they work and use them to their advantage. I mean, they change their algorithms every couple of weeks. It's a bit of a nightmare working with them, but I think you do need to understand how it works to really get the benefit from it. And to be able to push your brand and to sort of your brand story is, is the most important thing you've got. You know, the quality of the product is obviously up there. You have to be able to tell the story. You have to be able to communicate what you're, what you're all about. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, we designed the uh, topic today more to uh, address the, the changing uh, trends. Uh, what you say, mm. Nikki is absolutely right. And, and, uh, in a sense, it has been true for years that you have to understand what the consumer wants and you have to you know, communicate to them what are those features of your uh, product. But, uh, you know, we are all in food business and uh, in food, going to the uh, point of sale uh, and, you know, what, what you may call the touch, feel, taste, these are the important aspects. Now, mm. In the current uh, scenario, and certainly here in India, uh, the uh, brick and mortar shopping is still uh, sort of uh, not being followed by too many people. Uh, and I think in a sense, the, the online shopping or e-commerce uh, ha has gone up uh, tremendously. To some extent, it will uh, stay because people are getting habituated to it. Absolutely. How, yeah. do you, how do you address the, uh, your, your consumer in a situation like this? I mean, how do you uh, convince them? And particularly if it is a new product, a new brand, you know, established brands to that extent uh, find it easier to, mm. to, let's say, perpetuate and sustain their campaigns. But the new product introduction can be a bit of a challenge. And then you uh, talked about uh, Satviko. I mean, that's a relatively new brand. Yeah, Nicole, you want to mm. raise your hand? Yeah. I was just going to um, speak to that from uh, my own perspective of, of building a food business here. And um, 
when operating locally within your own country, it, it's it's a lot simpler than on an international basis. However, um, in whatever market you you're playing in, I found that you can never give away too much free product. Really, mm. that's what it comes Absolutely. down to. And yeah. really, for me, I've discovered the hard way that um, giving away free product and um, driving user generated content, UGC, mm. is key or has been mm. key. Um, it's the cheapest marketing dollar you will ever spend is sending out your product to people to try it because, you know, in today's world with it, when they can't get out, you know, the whole taste testing thing, that's all down the toilet mm. because no one's um, doing it um, due to COVID, but um, giving away free product and inviting um, people to um, try your product and engage with it and, and develop content for you um, is kind of a win-win and yeah. I find that um, that UGC ha has become a key, absolute fundamental key part of um, our strategy. Yeah, I think that's really important. The little the sort of sample boxes that you can send yeah. out with a little bit mm -hmm. of information in them. And then people are far more likely, as you say, they're all, they've all been until very recently stuck in their homes. You know, they mm -hmm. take themselves on a little video, they stick it up on their Instagram, on their LinkedIn exactly. page or whatever, and then everybody hears about it. And I think and that, that way, I think you've built, you do, sorry, Nicole, you do build no, no, your community on. like that because those people will be talking to their friends, to their That's followers, right. to the, and so you're automatically building a community of people That's right. that will be interested in your brand. And I think it's important that when you undertake a strategy like that, again, tying back to authenticity, it has to enter at every touch point. So if you're sending something out, then you send a letter you know, from yeah. Raphael, I'm sure you do this with your pancake mixes and things. So, you know, if you're sending out samples, it, it's a personalised letter saying thank you. You know, we really appreciate mm -hmm. your support. And, you know, so every every touch point needs to be part, uh, it needs to tell the same story and the same message and be very personal yeah. and individualised. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, I think that's important. important. Very interesting. Yeah, I think that's, that's already one of uh, one uh, classic example of new age marketing you know sending the samples home and uh, mm. get, collecting feedback yeah Rafael, you wanted to add something yeah um just briefly to, to, to clarify so the the pancakes that's um smart sales is the brand that's my mother's business she started out 20 years ago um i have left when you described me as you know the tinder for food trade just to clarify that's an application that we're building <laughs> i am not a bot <laughs> i'm a person <laughs> um just try to stay authentic <laughs> uh, but yeah we you know we have a tagline everyone can export like nestle um and interesting right you have a career you had a big career with nestle but it's exactly that what nicole was just telling if Nowadays, without, let's say, without, I'm talking about the post pandemic world when the supply chain is up and running, at least in a better format than it is now. Um, people can build global brands if they get those pieces right. Like we have a particular customer from Australia um, called Beauty Bites. They make little collagen functional bites, um, capturing beauty, gut health. It's a completely female audience. The, the content that the users create for this brand um, is exactly, you know, what you, Nicole, you were just describing. They have user-generated content. They have built a, a really almost now expanding global community, and they've done that in two or three years' time. Um, they're mm -hmm. selling in the UK. They're selling in, in, in New Zealand now. We brought them to New Zealand. But on their own behalf, through the users, they got to Egypt. Like, we didn't even have that on the radar. So that's just amazing. Um, so adding to the authenticity, they know where to present them in which channels. And the founder of that particular brand, she has a strong story herself. So she goes on Instagram. Um, they bring stories of their life. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how they have grown. Uh, yeah, agreed with all this, but also know your channels, know where your customer, where your customer is sitting. But of course, yeah. if, you, if you represent your brand, if you have all those values in you, yeah, that it's it's not it's not sales it's just all marketing just flows kind of yeah and also i think it's important that we really be very careful as um, brands um, about content and our view of it and what our consumers view of it is because mm -hmm. i was looking at some research just recently whereby what was it it was um what type of contact highly impacts your purchasing decisions and it was um, authenticity and um, it, um, with 
consumers connecting with what you were doing, not just branded product style or presentation. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it was so interesting because um, the consumer created content scored at an eighty percent of consumers preferred a consumer generated content, um, but. Funnily enough, the marketeers, so the people selling, um, they thought that their what they were presenting was authentic, but their consumers don't. Yeah, their consumers yeah, don't. I think the con- so it's a yeah, real- the consumers believe what they're hearing, don't they? They believe somebody else because they see that. That's as right. A- impartial yeah, yeah, and we really need to understand the power of that and yeah. and that um how easy it is to switch off our consumers by uh, just straight advertising the old style you know here's our product mm. here's our you know and yeah it, and it is hard because it's such a thirsty machine it's a hungry beast mm-hmm. this um digital world that just wants to be fed so so much and and i think it's danger as smaller brands or, or startups or um, entrepreneurs, you know, we, we get um, so concerned about, oh, I'm not posting enough and, you know, and I yeah. think that we can go down that rabbit hole and I think we can fall into a trap of, you know, putting crap out there that, you know, consumers, they don't want to see. So I think, mm. you know, quality over quantity um, is the preference and, um, re- again, back to the UGC. So Absolutely. Nicole, you mentioned yeah. uh, uh, you could you could put off or switch off the uh, consumers, and um, of course the importance of brand cannot be undermined by any of us. Uh, <clears throat> is there also a trend in the current uh, scenario that uh, people are showing less loyalty to brands, particularly the new brands? I mean, is is there is there a switch? Or, or an attempt to try a new brand because it is, you know, available on the the digital media, the social media, and this all right. Mm-hmm. Let me try that. Is 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 that happening also uh, quite a bit? Uh, maybe not mm-hmm. because I think I think people are less um, sort of brand followers than they used to be. And again, we're back to that that story and that authenticity. People are more like if they believe in what you're saying. And what they're hearing about your brand, they're very likely to try it. If they can see that, you know, you've got a hundred and even you know hundred followers trying your brand and and saying good things about it and good things about you as a company, then they're far more likely to try it. Whereas the, I think the big brands now is is almost you know they're sort of people will probably buy something with a brand that they know as a first step into a market they don't understand. Yeah. But then they're more likely to experiment and try different different things. I think also it's it's interesting if you look at what rings true with that is you look at the big players like the larger chains. They're all trying to present a more bespoke platform. They're all yeah. um, all of them have now um, because they understand that consumers are. Um, uh, uh, not suspicious, but they're they're preferring a more bespoke community. You know that whole you mm. know um, homemade kind of vibe. Um, yeah, and I've noticed that all of them, like here in Australia, for example, you know the big the Woolworths, the Coles, they, they're now um, uh, launching new ranges of stores called Coles Local, and you know um, those kind of brands. So they're <clears throat> so they're obviously responding to consumer uh, drives in that direction. Yeah. yeah, we, we yeah. have that in the UK too. Yeah. Sorry. We, you know, the local ones have a local, a group of local suppliers. They'll buy their cheeses locally and they'll buy, you know, trying to, I think, play on the low impact on the environment as, as, yeah. as a thing that a lot of people are concerned about. Um, yeah. So but, that is, again, but, is what, another point. Raphael. But this, of course. Sorry, Raphael. Yeah, I was just thinking because you, okay, um, <clears throat> you mentioned calls. There's, there's one thing, of course, that these big guys have that smaller brands do not have. Um, if they see a successful brand and let's say they want to do a private label, uh, they see a market in it, they can play on the price that a small supplier, especially in the beginning, might struggle. So mm. they that's the only thing that sometimes by like, Anything that we have been discussing, I fully believe in it. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, Authenticity, story, user-generated content, all that, true. But quite often, big guys come in. They can put a budget to something that an SME or a startup can never do. And they sell it for 30% cheaper, 50% cheaper. Mm. And 
then it's turning problematic. And I, I do think that's a bit of a worrying trend in international trade, um, the power of private labels, because private labels are now in a position that they were not three, four years ago. They used to be mm. the cheaper alternative for a mass good, for a commodity. Those days are over. They they are becoming brands themselves and they're taking position. And I know in Australia, especially, there's a lot of discussion about this. Mm -hmm. um, but now more and more in New Zealand too, um, because it is, it is, yeah, you know, because uh, how should I put it? You, you, you go on, on shelf in a certain market, supermarket, I mean, in a channel, they know a lot about your product. Um, you make some kind of deal and suddenly they're evolving and putting their own label on it. Like IP wise, it's not always 100% like it should be. So yeah. I just want to uh, add that to it. Sure. Yeah. I think that that's a, it's a challenge, but I think it's a measure of the strength of the brands that they're taking on. My experience here in Australia has been quite different. Um, and I found that both the Coles and Woolworths um, innovation teams, because they're now on the hunt for um, successful startup you know young brands mm. that um are in a new category um and um they're actually offering um quite a lot of uh, there's an innovation fund um through coles there's seed lab through woolworths that they're supporting entrepreneurs through that journey to to grow their business and um valuing um the story and piggybacking on that if you like um to try and um gain consumer mm. Support so it's. It, I understand the pressures of the private label. I think. I think it does. It depends on the. Um, I think it does depend on the category you're in. Would you agree that there's different categories mm. that are more susceptible to that? Um, not takeover, but you know that um, that kind of uh, action. <clears throat> so it's an interesting question because what you just said. Is equally true. So, um, with with Martels, for example, with our, with my family's pancake brand, we we actually attended, you know, um, at the Macquarie University, I think in, uh, in in Melbourne, we attended a couple of those workshops with the innovation centers, and it's amazing what they're doing. And uh, I know they're reaching out. I know they're also doing a lot of good stuff. So it's both sides are true. And to say is it more true within a certain channel or or certain products more susceptible to it? Honestly, I, I don't know. I, mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe, I don't I, know. I think- so I, I, I mean, I'm sure that we, we do expect uh, a few uh, different experiences in different markets. So it all sure. depends mm -hmm. on uh, that typical market. But so uh, Nicole, would Coles and Woolworths uh, uh, just encourage uh, these young startups to keep their brand or they encourage them and then well, like, yeah. ask them to manufacture under uh, the stored brand? No, they, they don't tend to be doing that. They, they're not going down the private label because that undermines, you know, the whole storytelling process. So mm. they're not tending to do that. But also yeah. bring, um, sorry, uh, just bringing it back to marketing, um, it, it's also a big part of that is the internal marketing and, and the relationship building that occurs, you know, if if you focus on relationship building with the buyers and the category managers and, th you know, they are perhaps one of the most important relationships in your life, right, mm. um, because they decide whether or not you stay on shelf or not. Um, so, um, you know, really um, ensuring that you have a, a similar message and, an, uh, uh, you know, aligned with your values and your story with them as well, I think is a crucial part of um, that relationship building so that I, I just recently launched a range of vegan pies into a Woolworths, um, a trial, you know, 30 odd mm. stores or so, and they weren't doing very well and, and that kind of thing. So, but because of relationships and them being very strong, we've, you know, taken a step back and said, let's hibernate it for a little while, get the sales data and um, reevaluate and, you know, get our message mm. right and then we'll try again in another month or so. So mm. COVID's also impacting very heavily here at the moment. Um, but uh, so from a marketing perspective, those internal relationships and those relationships with your buyers, um, good old-fashioned, you know, sales relationships are just so mm. 
fundamental and so crucial because you they'll support you through the tough times or you know if you're a bit shaky on sales from time to time well, Nicole, you said that uh, uh, COVID had an impact on uh, uh, the brands. Uh, tell me, uh, vegan, your 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 vegan made easy and uh, the vegan food, uh, is that being preferred a little more? Uh, because um, most yes. of these most of these viruses in the last uh, few years, you know, whether it is swine flu or the uh, you know mad cow disease or or this one which ostensibly came from a bat are uh, uh, you know emer- uh, sort of emerging from animals so uh, is is vegan food going up in uh, in popularity if i may put it that way oh, look it is everywhere um in australia australia is one of the fastest growing vegan markets albeit we're a smaller market but nevertheless this is mm. um reflected in every country uk in particular germany yeah. Um, United Arab Emirates, you know, like everywhere, US. Um, so yes, it is. But what I've noticed, what I, there's no way I could have launched a product called Vegan Made Easy five years ago. They would have kicked me to the door. They would have, you know, oh, you know, you're a lizard licking, mm. tree hugging, you know, hippie, get out. Yeah, perception um, has changed. <laughs> yeah, perceptions, isn't it funny how it changes, you know. I've always been ahead of my time. Um, anyway, so but um, but it's so the 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 word, the phrase, the, the whole understanding of veganism has just um, really gone through the roof, and which does make it harder for those of you that are in the plant based food space because what's happening is that you know um, the good old airplane test hands up who's vegan they were quite easy to find weren't they um but now of <laughs> course um there's the um you know, oh i'm vegan on a monday um you know that crew which is the new and enormous um flexitarian mm-hmm. um group yeah. the yeah. rise of the flexitarian yeah. so that's just such an opportunity but bloody hell they're hard to find aren't they because they're everywhere <laughs> Hard to pinpoint. <laughs> They're everywhere. Um, but no, so it does make it difficult if you are in that plant-based space. Um, it, it is becoming, that's my next biggest challenge is trying to, still trying to reach this broader market, but not alienate, you know, the hardcore, you know, fundamentals, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, the vegans. Um, so, but so in answer to your question, yes, it's um, significantly on the rise. And I have noticed that, with my rebrand now to um, Vegan Made Easy, which is my new brand, um, that has had um, an exponential impact on sales. So now that I'm a very obvious call out on shelf, that's my other advice is don't try and be clever, just be obvious, you know, um, yeah. just keep it simple, <laughs> you know, um, let, let unless me, you've got, unless the you've old got kiss and wrong. <laughs> exactly. Let, let me bring got... the, the discussion back to our uh, topic, you know, where yes. uh, we really wanted to talk about the, uh, uh, let's say the platform that we are trying to, you know, uh, yeah. use for uh, marketing. Yes. Uh, one area which has which has really uh, I think gone up a lot in terms of viewership is the OTT. Uh, a lot of you know sitting at home and uh, watching uh, content. Uh, so you know whether it is Netflix or Amazon or whatever it is, mm. these are the kind of things where where your uh, advertising uh, or uh, you know promoting your product has become to that extent a lot more relevant. So. Um, Content marketing. Uh, sorry, content marketing. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Nikki, you have uh, because you've been growing brands uh, globally. What do you say to that? Um, well, we the, the brands that I'm working with at the moment are smaller brands and don't have the budget for that sort of marketing. To be honest with you, um, because it's extremely expensive. Um, so we're we're really looking at. I think for, for for that sort of content marketing on the big platforms, you have to have serious budgets behind you. Um, that is one of the the holdbacks to it. Um, but I think, that, as we were saying, that you know the the other side of that is like the video marketing and things like that are are going up 
um, not necessarily just on the big platforms, on local things, on, on local local streaming channels. Um, if you can get if you can get your sort of information out there with smaller companies, then it works. But I think as as for the big big guys, possibly the best way to get. I mean, we've we found this is if you can get your content included in a short movie or something like that, just as a, as a giveaway. So you know you go, it's actually on film rather than as an advert, then people notice it that way. But in terms of the budgets that are required for these big channels, it, it's prohibited for most smaller companies. I think that's an important point. The budgets are uh, are a deterrent. Yeah. And, and I think uh, for those with small budget, perhaps digital marketing becomes even more relevant because you can, yeah. uh, you know, uh, use smaller budgets for more sort of uh, focused marketing on your uh, target audience, which has uh, less of, let's say, the uh, uh, wasteful uh, uh, you know, spillover. I think mm. the key here is to pick a channel and do it well. Honestly, mm. I think that I, I've learned from the hard way. It's just you know, you can spread yourself way too thin, invest an enormous amount of money in paid advertising across all of the platforms. And honestly, I believe that now with the algorithms the way they are now, I think that unless you've got serious coin, it's a waste of money. You're better to pick one channel that is best suited to you and do your it audience yeah. and just do it properly. Just pick yeah. one. Don't You don't mm -hmm. have to be all things for people. Just pick one. I think, for I me, think you're for me, it's what... Facebook uh, more than anything. That's where most of my consumers. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you're forgetting one important uh, thing that usually comes on top of marketing. It's PR, um, classical yes. PR. Yeah. Like um, <clears throat> what we applied at Marcel. So I started for Jackie two, two, two years, two and a half years ago. Until then, I, I ran Marcel's marketing. Um, we usually had a PR campaign. Mm -hmm. parallel going out with user-generated content with hashtags. So that mm -hmm. was the thing up to three, four years ago when you went into Instagram um, <clears throat> and you send out a lot of free product, beautifully designed, um, then with some food publications, with some mainstream media, mm -hmm. and then get a gathering of blo bloggers, Instagrammers, and journalists all together mm -hmm. trying your food. And with pancakes, it's amazing what you can do with them, especially with little, little tiny bites. Um, that just like I, I couldn't I couldn't believe it in an event in Perth at some point and we bloggers were writing about pancakes and people going out on the beach in bikini in swimsuits with vegan with our gluten free pancakes you know that's something you you wouldn't think of but it's it was showing like oh this is my treat so those two things together because you get you get a feature article in the main newspaper. At the same time, you're on Instagram. So we focused on those two channels mm -hmm. with a very small budget because we didn't have mm -hmm. too much budget. It was a family business. So, yeah. 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 I think I think if you're talking to, if you're planning a PR campaign and talking to the relevant journalists in the magazines who are interested in that sort of thing. So for, in the UK, you'd be sort of, for something healthy, like the vegan pancakes, gluten-free pancakes, and you'd be talking to Women's Health, you'd be talking to Red, Cosmopolitan, people like that who have their their healthy food sections within them. And you speak to those girls and you send them the, the samples and you send them all out. I think, as you were saying, it's sort of the timing is really important as well, because yeah. that's your best way of making a big splash in the market is mm. using your channel in a mm. concentrated effort. And as Nicole was saying earlier, don't try and do it all the time, do it in mm. little bite-sized chunks almost, you mm. know, every, every month do something different or, you know, I think that's really important. Mm. So if I'm, um... If I'm not uh, wrong, uh, I hear that, that you're all talking about uh, emergence in a very strong way about digital marketing. And of course, depending on your budget, you pick up which uh, channel, but that the relevance of analog marketing not completely gone away. As Rafael said, you could be having a newspaper ad or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, any, uh, before we, you know, uh, ask for questions from the audience uh, any wrap up uh, comments from uh... yeah we... like if you say sorry. analog i would i would just say, sorry uh, didn't want to interrupt but pack packaging your packaging is absolutely. your first marketing absolutely platform mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah it mm -hmm. has to work 
so hard because, you know, getting it on shelf is often the easy part, but making sure that you meet those weekly per unit, per store, per week sales. Yeah, yeah. Happen it's got to be attractive. If you're doing anything, then yeah. it's your packaging does that for you. And it's so mm. important to get it right. Hell, I've, you know, I've made a whole bunch of mistakes mm. over the last five years, but I feel like I finally got it right. But I think, you know, it's such a journey. Crucial. We've, yeah, we've done in the past, we've had... Um, when we've tried to do some NPD with, with different companies, you've got your sort of core of influencers that are interested in those things. And then you can send them, which, you know, what do you prefer? What do you think looks best? And you can almost use them as your sort of sounding board. Yeah. That works quite well. And if 100%. you've got a, a core of 20 people who are really interested in what you're doing, they love to feel part of that development. And, and I think you get really good feedback from those people. It's honest, it's, you know, it's consumer driven. I, I actually developed my packaging with the help of um, online Facebook groups. I put up, um, yeah. which one do you like best? What yeah. do you think it's missing? And the it was invaluable. It actually yeah. shaped my packaging. And yeah. and then it, the finished product then got, you know, I posted that and said, look what everyone did. We did this Great together. Reviews. Yeah, yeah. You know, there so, you are. I mean, you're, you're getting the low cost market research. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I'm glad that you brought up this issue of, you know, packaging being uh, so important as an advertising mm. tool, um, but which also brings me to one of my favorite uh, quotes, which is that good packaging and like good advertising can sell your product once, but it's eventually the quality of the product. And as you have used the word mm -hmm. authenticity, and, uh, you know, there are other things which people are now looking at, which is health hygiene, particularly post pandemic. Those are the kind of things. And, you know, what are the deliverables of the product? But yes, definitely packaging, good advertising would uh, induce that trial the first time. Yeah. Right. So, Dhawal, uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, so, uh... I think this was such an insightful session. Uh, thank you so much for this. So uh, audience, I mean, uh, if you have any question, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask. Else you can also post it on the chat. So there have been a few comments there, but I don't see any of them being uh, questions really. So if anybody yeah. has a question. Can I, while we're waiting for some questions, can I make another point? It's just been a really um, big lesson for me. And that is that, I've been very fortunate that with the COVID impact that I am a predominantly retail um, supply based business. However, having what I've noticed as we all have is seeing companies go under that have had all their, had all their eggs in one basket, particularly in the food service sector. Um, and I was striving to have food service represent, you know, 40 or 50% of my revenue stream by last year. Clearly that didn't happen because everyone went out of business, but um, that's certainly a, a consideration for me now. And I think from a marketing perspective, um, it's about getting those channels, um, you know, making sure that you don't have all of your eggs in one basket because God knows what could happen if retail goes under, we're screwed, right? Uh, so to make sure that you've got your balance right, and that you've got a good mix that you're not relying entirely on one. And that's a very different marketing approach in the food service sector with food products than it yeah. is with retail. So I just wanted to make that point that it's super important. Yeah. Is there also a growing emergence of uh, home delivery rather than people going to the store and picking up? I'm talking about, uh, you know, uh, ready to eat food you know not not just e-commerce we i yeah. mean in, in the uk sorry Raphael, and i'm on. saying it with reference to your food service uh, comment um yes um although the, the sector is still being <clears throat> savagely impacted so it's a little hard to assess at the minute um mm. it's it's a bit of a mess down here <laughs> no, no, I'll, t I'll tell you why i asked this in in uh, delhi for instance right now the restaurants have been closed, but restaurant deliveries are allowed, you know, home yeah. delivery. So, Same. so that, that yeah. to that extent, they are benefiting from uh, the current situation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, 
Can I say something? Uh, exactly. The brands, um, you know, when COVID started, that just plunged that were only in food service. And the, the few ones that survived were the ones that managed to adjust to this uh, home delivery, yeah. Uber Eats yeah. kind of type of environment. So, yeah, that was definitely a shift that we saw. Like when I started with Food Jockey in the beginning of COVID, uh, we had stories of companies going bankrupt like like that. You know, I, I was doing my market research and people were crying on the phone like, oh, man, I business that exists for 20 years, but a couple survived. Mm-hmm. That, that were the ones who, who <clears throat> understood home delivery um, and not just in food, the same in drink, actually, like the big trend now in drink is this ready to drink thing. So, yeah. Just well, do, do, did you have a market where people could go? They couldn't go into the restaurant or the cafe, but they could go and pick something up. They could go and collect. Because that's what was happening in the UK. Yeah. yeah. Lots and lots yeah. of that. Um, and that, that, I think, saved an awful lot of businesses here. It's, yep. um, and I, as, you, as you were saying, Nicole, you have to balance your risks. You have to make sure you're sort of, yeah. there's always a backup plan. There's always something going on in the background. You, you need, especially... Spread, business, Spread yeah. it. Absolutely. <laughs> let, let, let me mention another, uh, uh, let's say, experience that, that we all had during the lockdown. You know, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, in India, there is a lot of uh, dependence on uh, uh, staff for, for cooking, particularly amongst a certain uh, class of people. And during the lockdown, the domestic staff couldn't come to the house. And that's when you know, uh, the the uh, need for uh, ready to cook, ready to eat, you know, that one step recipe and two step recipes were uh, gaining uh, in, uh, in 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 popularity. So there are lots of things, and uh, as as Rafael said, I mean, people have to be uh, flexible. They have they have to uh re-engineer themselves and uh, present themselves in a new way in the changing times and times will keep changing at all times it's, it's not that uh, uh, that that uh, you know it's only now that new age marketing has come there will be new age marketing 10 years from now and that will be different yeah mm. we have one question on the chat you you um, were talking about um, netflix you were talking about Netflix, but a channel where you could actually get in if you have the right product for that particular channel is gaming, <clears throat> digital gaming. Mm-hmm. So if you have a brand and that's where your, your people are sitting, you're going to see that particular segment growing like crazy, I think, in the coming two or three, four years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there is a question on chat. Uh, Hitesh Batra has asked, what steps an Indian brand should take to enter into foreign markets, for example, basmati rice. Very, very fundamental Mm. uh, Mm. question. I can't help with that. (laughs) Yeah. It's tricky. I mean, I think, you know, something like basmati rice is is so widely sold throughout the world. Um, You would need a point of differentiation. You're sort of something specific that you could say about your product to get people to actually try it. Um, I think it's, uh, it's seen as such a commodity, a a base commodity for most people that you'd have to have something quite special to, to get that sale, to get that initial interest. Yeah. And and, uh, I think uh, uh, these, these uh, suggestions or advice for, what what things to be kept in mind uh, to launch a new brand is is something that that could perhaps be the subject of discussion on another uh, panel discussion altogether. Definitely, uh, yeah. How to formulate your sort of brand to make it work? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Gotham uh, I, I can... B has asked, uh, "What is the next big thing in Instagram? Do you think if we are into DTC food brand, should we?" focus on reels or posts, do you think Facebook is still relevant for DTC? So I think that um, reels, reels have certainly um, jumped. I've noticed that um, as far as getting seen and having posts seen, the reels are uh, way outstripping any other format um, that you post. So reels are the current 
a hot thing. Um, it, it, assuming that you're going to make sure that they're relevant, and yeah. um, then then I think that that's that's what's hot at the moment, or that's what's yeah, getting some really recent. Hot. Yeah, there's some recent research done on that, and though 68% of people were saying that they actually preferred to see a short video, just mm. a real short clip, something that was interesting and pertinent to the brand than anything yeah. else. So that's a huge, a huge number. Mm. So I think reels, mm. as you're saying, Nicole, reels are definitely up there. Yeah. Yeah, they're I mean, definitely vi video. Sorry. Video is. I mean, TikTok, big TikTok is surpassing Facebook, surpassing. Mm whichever other platform you talk about Instagram, you know, TikTok is the new thing, especially for the really young people. But um, you see the same in B2B marketing, you know, and on LinkedIn, the more video content, the better you are at video content, the stronger you'll be getting B2B mm -hmm. as well. So definitely your reels and video, yeah, on that one. Just the thing on the basmati rice, um, I was thinking like first, yeah, it's a commodity, like as a product, okay, that's going to be very tough. But think about, noodles coming from Japan, coming from some Asian countries, repacked, vacuum tight into ready to eat thingies that you put in a microwave in 10, 15 seconds and you're done. And some people that I have built very successful brands like that. So think a bit broader and think again about everything that we've been saying here. So then Hitesh will have a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to look at the value add when you're in that space. Yeah, yep. you've got to you've got to look at a, a problem that you can solve for the consumer, you know, or something they haven't even thought of as a problem yet. <laughs> who, yeah. who would have thought the that we would? Subtle, subtle difference between what you said, Rafael, and uh, basmati rice is that those noodles, whether you're talking about cup noodles or something, uh, those are virtually ready to eat because there is already a spice maker uh, or sauce or so, right. yeah. Whereas basmati rice, you know, you have to really make from scratch unless it's a rice and spice you know like uh, mm. Mm. Okay. now there's yes, a good name for a brand quick register before the wall is going to put the ip to it <laughs> 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 All right. So, Dawal, if there are no further questions, um, you have anything to say? Sure. No, I mean, I just wanted to thank you all once again and uh, really appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to many more discussions. So, thank you so much for your time once again. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Lovely to speak with you. It was great fun. It was great fun uh, talking to all of you. Very interesting. Yeah. And if anyone's yeah, got any questions, you know, like I, I think we all agree, you know, I think we're all good sharers on this platform. Yeah, absolutely. And I think <laughs> if there's anyone out there that have specific questions to your own startup or your own food product or your own journey that you'd like some advice on, then please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or whatever platform or via yeah. websites. But, you know, I know that we're all super happy to help and make absolutely. the journey easier because I know that we all received help you know, back down the track. I know everyone that I ever asked for help gave it. So I'm happy to help as I'm sure everyone else is. That's very true. Yeah, sure. Thanks. All right. Nice That's to meet great. you. That's great. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Yeah, Bye. yeah thanks all. Bye. Bye-bye. Nikki, Nicole. Thanks. See you.